Good evening. Let me add my welcome to all of you to the sixth lecture in the India Lecture Series. As some of you who've been regular uh, attendees know, our previous speakers have included uh, Professor Devesh Kapoor of UPenn, uh, Arvind Panagiri of Columbia, Raghuram Rajan of Chicago, and we also had the distinguished uh, historian uh, Ramachandra Guha talk about his work on Gandhi uh, some time back. I also want to add my own thanks to the donors who've made this event uh, possible. Like many of the other events at the center, we're able to open these up to the public and run it uh, free of uh, charge. And um, grateful thanks to those uh, donors, including the anonymous donor who uh, really had, had his heart on, on starting an India lecture series some time back. Now, our speaker today, we are very fortunate to have in that line of distinguished speakers, Ashutosh Varshne from Brown University. Ashutosh is the Saul Goldman Professor of International Studies and the Social Sciences and Professor of Political Science at Brown University, where he also directs the Center for Contemporary South Asia. We were exchanging notes of, a few minutes back. He said, my center, our center here, the Center for Emerging Markets, is quite young. And I said, for us, 12 years doesn't seem that young. And uh, it turns out his center is, is it 11 years old or, or something like that? Um, nine. nine years old, OK. Uh, and the focus really is on India plus the, the region more, more broadly. Ashutosh has worked on India and politics and democracy in India for uh, many years. I remember when he was at Harvard and I had the pleasure of listening to some of his uh, work. And he then moved to Michigan, and then a few years back moved to Brown, where he's now running the center. Among his books on politics and democracy in India, there is Battles Half Won, India's Improbable Democracy. I think that's a theme that will probably come up again in his presentation today. Ethnic Conflict and Civic Life, Hindus and Muslims in India, which I think had a lot of impact and got very wide recognition. Again, I think it's a theme that will probably come up again this evening, India in the Era of Economic Reforms. Again, I know you don't plan to focus that much on economic reforms today, but it's certainly something that's on uh, many of our minds, and so we may pick it up in Q&A. And Democracy Development and the Countryside, Urban Rural Struggles in India. He's also received many awards for his work, including the Guggenheim Fellowship, the Carnegie Fellowship, the Gregory Lubbard Prize, and the Daniel Lerner Prize. And he's been a consultant and an advisor to many international organizations, including the World Bank, uh, UNDP, and the Club of uh, Madrid. This evening, as you know, the theme of his talk is Democracy in India, Achievements and Deficits. I think the timing is perfect. We just had a, a, an election, important election in India. Uh, Prime Minister Modi won a second term with a bigger margin than anyone expected. At the same time, India's uh, transformation and changes, both economically and politically, uh, raise a lot of questions. And I think it's wonderful to have the opportunity to explore it with someone like Ashutosh. So Ashutosh, thank you so much for being here, and welcome. Thank you, uh, Ravi, for the invitation. Thank you all for coming. Can you hear me? And I have uh, this microphone taped to my, my jacket, so I'll move around a little. Uh, and um, um, I've been working um, on democracy for quite some time, though uh, more for the consequences of democracy um, uh, f let's say for ethnic relations or, or um, agricultural sector, also economic reform, as, as was mentioned. But the book that I'm writing now is um, basically focused on democracy in India and how it has evolved, what the achievements are, and what the deficits are, and where it's headed. Um, so um, with that kind of focus, the argument that is emerging is here. 
India's electoral democracy is recognized by democratic theorists worldwide as historically exceptional. And I'll give you some data on this, especially given its level of income. But India has functioned less well as a liberal democracy, and the gaps can be conceptualized as liberal deficits. So I'm drawing, uh, using democratic theory, I'm drawing a distinction between electoral democracy and liberal democracy. Uh, the two to be explained in a moment. Hmm? The 2019 elections and developments since then demonstrate that India's democratic evolution has reached a stage where the electoral and liberal aspects of democracy are now in a deep, perhaps alarming conflict. India's electoral vibrancy is not in doubt, but the liberalism of its polity is in precipitous decline. India is threatening to become an illiberal democracy, a term to be, all of this will be explained. This is my argument for this evening. <clears throat> so now let's go into the terms, what these terms mean in democratic theory. I'm a political scientist. I'm speaking here as a political scientist who's, who is trying to see how much of democratic theory applies to India and in what form. Hmm. Um, something like one third of the entire profession of political science works on democracy, uh, just as one third of the entire profession of economics works on economic growth. Uh, so it's, it's central to our life. Um, so uh, here are some the key elements of modern democratic theory, a simple summary. The minimum requirement of a democracy is electoral. Elections should allow free contestation of the incumbent. This is important. It's not just free contestation, free contestation of the incumbent. Unrestrained contestation vis-a-vis -vis the incumbent who has lots of power, who has control over state machinery. And, and participation without any qualifications for gender, income, ethnicity, race, religion. At least legally, all should be allowed to participate in elections. And any association, any political party should be able to contest the incumbent. This is the minimum requirement. But there's a broader requirement in democratic theory. The broader requirement is that there also should be liberal freedoms between elections. And there are three freedoms. Liberalism as a term is a contested term. There's a lot of work available. But all the definitions of political liberalism, they, they might be broad, they might have, the list could be quite long, but three freedoms appear in every list. Freedom of expression, freedom of religious practice, and freedom of association. The association not simply about political parties. The term civil society means that beyond uh, the state and beyond political parties also, you should be able to form associations, religious, non-religious, professional, etc. student unions, teachers unions, of various kind, um, um, non-state based associations, you should be able to freely form and participate freely in. Um, so those two, those two, there's a minimum requirement, there's a broader requirement, and there are three other, um, those are normative, there are three other empirical um, um, statements. Empirically based theory would say the following. The, <clears throat> the relationship between income and democracy that absolutely runs through the literature as, a send, as its core. Democracies can be established at low levels of income, at any level of income, but their survival rate, they survive mostly at high levels of income. The mortality rate of democracies at low levels of income is very high. We'll get into some more details of this. Another empirical finding from the West, applying also to South America, Western Europe, North America, and South, and South America is that the richer you are, the more educated you are, the greater the likelihood you will vote. The poorer you are, the less educated you are, the more rural you are, 
the lower the probability you'll vote. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, another um, interesting uh, point that is associated with Samuel Huntington, which is the, the, uh, the argument about democratic consolidation. When does democratic consolidation begin? The minimum required is two turnovers. What's a two turnover principle? Incumbents today, the existing government today, when voted out, leaves, and those who win come in. They run, run the government. When they are defeated, they also leave, and those who win run the government. This should happen. Once this happens, democratic consolidation has begun. In many parts of the world, governments, when they're defeated, cancel the election. Simply cancel the election. Hmm? When they right? So, so this is the, the minimum condition is incumbents today, when defeated, go out. Incumbents tomorrow, when defeated, go out. Mm? This is the beginning of democratic consolidation. Not democratic consolidation, uh, deep democratic consolidation, but the beginning of it. <clears throat> so let's first go through the minimum requirement um, and uh, um, the, the India's performance on the minimum requirement, elections. Mm? And here is India's electoral vibrancy, which has been noted widely. Since 1952, 17 national elections, 372 state elections. Since 1992, 3 million local legislators are elected every five years, one third women by law. This is a huge election machinery. This is the most, the biggest election machinery of the world. Mammoth, absolutely. Hmm? Power has changed hand eight times in Delhi and tens of times at the state level. Political scientists don't count state level turnovers anymore. That many turnovers have taken place, which satisfies the Huntingtonian two turnover principle many times, many, many times. So this is a consolidated democracy at the electoral level. In 1952, 81 million votes were cast. In 2019, nearly 610 million votes were cast. There are so many voters that you can't have, an, have a one-day election. You have to spread it over. With 610 million, the, 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 the size was 920, 610 voted. Uh, turnouts now routinely in excess of 60%. The last two elections, 2014-2009, had record turnouts, over 65%. Mr. Modi won two most participatory elections in India's history. 66% and 67% turnout. Hmm? Until 1989, following mainstream democratic theory, the richer and more educated citizens used to vote more than the poorer and the less educated. Since 1989, defying democratic theory, the poor and the less educated have voted as much as, if not more, than their more fortunate co-citizens. Hence the argument that India, Indian democracy has developed a plebeian thrust. Those in the countryside, those at the lowest tiers of income, participate as much in elections as the richer, the more educated, and the urban. Um, not consistent with democratic theory, uh, uh, defiance of it. And since 90, it's about 30 years of defiance. The poor have taken to democracy. You might want to ask why. That's a separate question, but this is just data. Um, here, are, here is India's uh, election electoral democracy um, compared to some the major world regions. So the Indian line here is red. The, the Western Europe northern line is this. Note that India is, is basically only below the West Europe North American line for election democracy. How this is calculated, I'll be happy to explain, but that need not detain us here. This is sort of done by, has been done for such a long time and has been peer reviewed so much that there is general acceptance that general acceptance about how to calculate, how to measure electoral democracy. India is above every other region. And um, this is a slightly complicated thing, so let, if necessary, we'll come back to it. Uh, this has generated the puzzle about income. 
Hmm? Why is India only? No, no, why we will come to why later. The idea that India at a low level of income is basically just below North America and Western Europe, where income levels are so high, has led to a larger argument about, about income and democracy. And the most famous argument, most famous democratic theorist connecting the two, is Adam Shvorsky at NYU. His data set covered 141 countries between, between 1950 and 1990. And, uh, Anyone who's econometrically oriented here can see that these, these things can be done very easily, that 77.5% of the cases predicting democracy are income-based. Income predicts democracy in 77.5% of cases. No other predictor, single predictor is as good. Colonial legacy, religion, people used to say that religion is important, Islam, Islam, Islamic countries won't be democratic, turns out that income is the main issue. Hmm? Uh, colonial legacy, ethnic diversity, international political environment, they explain only 22.5% as a whole. Income predicts 77.5. Mm -hmm. India clearly is the latter 22.5% set. You can specify it further. If you consider only decolonized countries after 1950, then the set that emerges as stable democracies, that set, is India, Mauritius, Belize, Jamaica, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu. That's it. Now, those who, that emerged from colonization earlier, like Costa Rica, are also very stable democracies. But Costa Rica is the only stable democracy of Latin America and at a per capita of nearly $10,000. Hmm? India's per capita income has led to the following in this big research program the following claim, the most surprising case is India. The odds against democracy in India were extremely high. All other poorer exceptions had higher income than India. And this, we can give you that data. Just look at this, only this. In 27, according to the World Bank, the per capita incomes of these countries, the current prices, these are stable democracies outside the Western Europe. Botswana, 7,596. Costa Rica, over, I was saying 10, no, it's 11,677. Jamaica, 9,114. Mauritius, over 10,000. Papua New Guinea, 2,489. And India is close to $2,000. 1,942 in 2011. So of the, all the exceptions that we have outside the West, this is the biggest exception. Some other countries have defined the pattern on the obverse side, which we should note. If India is the biggest, biggest exception on the low income end, Singapore is the biggest exception on the high income end. Singapore's per capita income is today higher than that of UK, its former colonial master, France, and Germany. They are all around thirty-eight to forty-five thousand dollars per capita. These countries, and Singapore has. Has, has reached 52, 53, 54,000. Last I saw it was $53,000 per capita, um, which is about 5,000 less than America. At that, uh, I haven't seen the latest. There could be, uh, I, I don't, I won't, I won't expect the, the, I won't expect Singapore to, to have, to, uh, to have exceeded the United States per capita income, but somewhere there. It's 50,000 plus. And the only non-oil rich country in the world which is not democratic. Otherwise, oil rich, oil rich have not been democratic, then their per capita can, can be 40,000, 35,000, 45,000, depending on where you are, depending on what happens to oil price, right? So they also fluctuate, Those, the, the GDPs fluctuate because of this high dependence on oil and, and oil prices fluctuate, right? So uh, other than them, there is no rich country in the world which is not democratic, Singapore is the only exception. It is a rich country today, is the only exception. Now, um, um, this is the income-based argument, which is called no wealth, no democracy. I want you to concentrate on something else, uh, which has emerged from older democratic theory, and many of us are trying to now work on it. This is the idea that democracy is not possible without no nationhood. No nation, no democracy. Nationhood essential for democracy with its rampant social diversity is a key argument long forgotten but significant and <coughs> worth retrieving, which is I'm ret some of us are retrieving it now in our current work, was also that India could not be a nation 
Since it could not be a nation, it could not be a democracy either. So what is this argument about the relationship between nation and democracy? It starts with the, the father of modern liberalism, a father of modern democratic theory. Uh, not everything he said was right, but he set us on, set us on the path of, of theoretical evolution. And that's John Stuart Mill, 1860. 1860s. This should be free. representative government should be 1864 or 1865. Free institutions are next to impossible in a country made up of different nationalities. Among a people without fellow feeling, essentially if they read and speak different languages, the united public opinion necessary to the working representative government cannot exist. You might want to ask why. Why, if a country has many languages, why it won't work? Hmm? The argument is that 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 some kind of united public sphere is necessary for people to make judgments about who will rule. And if a nation does not exist, there are doubts about whether the different communities are part of the nation, they want to be separate nations, then elections would not be about who will rule us. Elections will also be about who is part of the nation, who is not part of the nation, and these battles are bloody can be bloody, or not necessarily, but can be bloody. So for a regular election process to work, you have to have a nation in place where the question is not which group should be excluded and thrown out. Hmm? There has to be some, some common loyalty to a center. That's basically the argument. Now, India, according to Mill's theory, was not only not a nation in 1860s, but could not be a nation. And Mill, John Stuart Mill, was extremely influential at the highest levels of British India. And here is one of the, one of the best known quotes from John Strachey, uh, where, uh, not a viceroy, but in Viceroy's cabinet, a very important administrator from 1888. Look at what is, this is not a cheap put down, this is a serious argument, and I'll explain in a moment. There is not, and never was in India, or even any country of India, possessing, according to any European ideas, any sort of unity, physical, political, social, or religious, and that men of Punjab, Bengal, the northwestern provinces, and Madras should ever feel that they belong to one India is impossible. You might, this is very important, you might, with as much reason and probability, look forward to a time when a single nation will have taken the place of the various nations of Europe. This is basically an argument that we call today the, today the distinction between a civilization and a nation. Europe is a civilization which consists of 20 odd nations. A civilization is a cultural construct, whereas a nation is a political construct. It might be based on cultural criteria, but it's a political construct. Civilization is a cultural construct. So the claim here is that India is a civilization like Europe, India is a civilization like Europe, and when it becomes independent, it will not be one nation. It will be like Europe, 22 nations, 23 nations, when the British leave. This is the argument. Hmm? It's a cultural construct. There is no political construct in India called, in, uh, uh, called a nation, Indian nation. Now, I, I, could, I could skip this, but I'm, I, I don't want to skip this because Mark Twain not a political scientist, a great literary genius of all times, is a favorite author of mine. And Mark Twain is a favorite author of a lot of Americans. Mark Twain travels through India in 1890s and writes this truly interesting, uh, uh, writes a truly interesting essay on India. Here is the core. India had the first civilization. She had the first accumulation of material wealth. She was populous with deep thinkers. He went around for six months and talked to lots of people. Deep thinkers and subtle intellects. It would seem as if she should have kept the lead and she should be today not the meek dependent of an alien master called Britain. But in truth, there was never any possibility of such supremacy for her. If there had been but one India and one language, but there were 80 of them, where there are 80 nations and several hundred governments Fighting and quarreling must be the common business of life. Unity of purpose and policy are impossible. Patriotism can have no healthy growth. It's the same argument. But written by one of the great literary geniuses of, a, of, of certainly modern times, I think all times, but certainly modern times. Hmm? 
um, just going, to, traveling in India and picking up something very important here. Hmm? This is a civilization, this is not a nation. Hmm? So here is Gandhi's response. Gandhi's attempt can be read today as turning a civilization into a nation. Hmm? So first, Gandhi led the freedom movement. First thing uh, he does, he, he, he talks about hyphenating Indian identity. We called it hyphenation today. This was something called something else. That Indians will be Bengali Indians, Tamil Indians, Telugu Indians, Maharashtrian Indians, Gujarati Indians, etc. There is no fundamental con conflict between them. There is a hyphen, which we call it a hyphen in America. That was not, that, so I'm using modern terminology for that. He's saying we can all, Gujarati Indian is not a contradiction. Tamil Indian will not be a contradiction, right? So we can have our linguistic regional identities, but we can still develop a loyalty to a larger political center called India. So one identity is regional, another is superordinate or national. And the national identity would not be your Gujarati identity, would be your Indian identity. This has to be politically created. This doesn't exist. This is, a, this is the creation. So, so the, the whole idea of the freedom movement is, this is, the, this is, these are the sets of ideas that have to be taken by the freedom movement to every corner of India. Right? So the first thing you need to do, if you want to do that, you have to de-link language and nationhood, which was the basis for European nation making. Every, every country in Europe, with the exception of Switzerland, has a language or language spoken by 90% to 95% to 98%. Hmm? Right? So de-link language and nationhood. So Gandhi argues even English is acceptable as an Indian language. Imagine what the impact of the statement was when it became part of the freedom movement. 1920 is saying, this is how he's putting it. I do not want my house to be walled in on all sides and my windows to be stuffed. I want the cultures of all the lands to be blown about my house as freely as possible, but I refuse to be blown off my feet by any. We will call it today, today's political theory will call this cosmopolitan rootedness. You are rooted in India, but your windows are open. You will pick up ideas from wherever they come. Any ideas that you like, and you will pick them up, but you will nonetheless be rooted in India. There is no contradiction, he's arguing. He also delinks religion and nationhood. These, and the reason we are mentioning Gandhi is because his ideas become the central ideas of the freedom movement. Hmm? He is the original thinker here. Delink religion and nationhood. If the Hindus believe that India should be peopled only by Hindus, they are living in a dreamland. The Hindus, Muslims, Parsis, Christians, who have made India their country, are fellow countrymen, followers of different faiths and not different nations. We can have a multilingual nation, multilinguistic nation. We can also have a multi-religious nation. Nation is different from language and different from religion, is the argument here. Hmm? And in one of the most radical formulations of that, he said even the British don't have to leave. The English don't have to leave. It is not necessary for us to have as our goal the expulsion of the English. If the English become Indianized, we can accommodate them. Let them get rid of their arrogance. Their rulers all right. Let, if they accept Indian culture, they don't have to leave. They'll become part of the Indian nation when we... Independence doesn't mean getting expelling the British. Independence simply means that we will run our affairs. And if British want to be part of that, they are part of India. Right? This is the mainstream of the freedom movement. This is how Indian nation was created. Those who argue Indian nation is old, 5,000 years old, nationalism theory, democratic theory doesn't accept that claim. This is simply an ideological claim. Political unity of India was achieved to the extent it was, of course, Pakistan was born, so it was not a full, fully successful project. It was substantially not fully successful project. A nation was created by the freedom movement. When the British took India, they started with Bengal, no one saw that as an attack on India or capture of India. They saw it as a capture of Bengal. When they moved from Bengal to Madras, to southern, to South India, people saw that as capture of South India or capture of Mysore. Then they moved to Bombay. 
there was no Bombay then, they created Bombay, they moved to, to Western India, and they, they defeated Maratha Confederacy, that was seen as a defeat of Maratha, not India. The first time we get evidence of something happening in some part of what we call India, having nationwide implications, is 1919, and Amritsar massacre is the first incident we can find, which has nationwide implications. Even the mutiny of 1857 did not have nationwide implications. It was northern, basically. Right? So we can't say India has been a nation for 5,000 five, five, 5, years. India has been a civilization for 5,000 years. Na a nation thus created made democracy possible, right, is the, is the claim here. Um, okay, now let's turn to liberal deficits. We have 15 minutes more, right? Yes? Ravi? Uh, if Oh, then we have very enough time now for the, those were the achievements. Now let's get into deficits and failures. So as I said, there are three standard liberal freedoms common to virtually all definitions of liberalism. Freedom of expression, freedom of religious practice, and it was especially applied to minorities, right? Freedom of association. These freedoms are especially important for democracy between elections. Why? And here is the argument. Once the thresholds of contestation and participation are satisfied, a democracy can attain higher quality, or to use Robert Dahl, the greatest democ de democratic theorist since the uh, Second World War, um, spent all his time at Yale, uh, uh, an entire career at Yale. Uh, <clears throat> to use Robert Dahl's formulation, it can become deeper if liberal freedoms between elections are available. That is to say, if citizens are free to speak, associate and practice their faith. Thus, we cannot have a democracy without free elections, but a democracy would be deeper if non-electoral dimensions of freedom, not simply free vote, are also available. This goes beyond voting. And how, 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 how many people participate and how free are you to contest the incumbent, the government? There is a special uh, attention paid to minorities, especially after 1945, under liberalism. We should, we should uh, perhaps two, three minutes on this, uh, very important. All post-1945 democracies are not only based on the idea of power stemming from electoral majorities, but also on minority protections, now a requirement of liberalism, not earlier. Why did this happen? Let's go to this part. It happened because of Nazi Germany. The biggest theorists of democracy at that time, among them, Carl Schmitt, were arguing, he was a German legal theorist who ended up joining the Nazi, were, were drawing a distinction between democracy and liberalism. Democracy was about expression of majority wishes. Liberalism meant protection of individual freedoms and minority rights. And Infamously now, but famously then, he argued that Jews in Germany could be protected under liberalism, but not under democracy. If German majority wanted Jews to be secondary citizens and wanted them in concentration camps, democracy will permit that. It's only liberalism that would protect them. Hmm? So he drew a very sharp distinction. We did get concentration camps. A, a, a democratically elected Nazi Germany was born, which led to concentration camps and killing of six million Jews. Hence, after 1945, there is no democratic theorist who would say, who would take this line, draw this distinction, all democracies are liberal democracies, or at least deeper democracies are liberal democracies. Minorities must be protected. Why? Minorities can protect themselves by, cannot protect, sorry, majorities can protect themselves by the numerical weight. Minorities don't have the numbers. Hence, minority rights always constitutionally protected in modern democracies. Here, minority means racial, ethnic, or religious minority, not simply a numerical minority. Numerical, ethnically mixed minorities must submit to majority wishes. That's a democratic principle. So long as it's not linked to a race, the term minority, not linked to a religion, not linked to an ethnicity, if it's simply mixed up, 
then yes, minorities have to submit to majority wishes. But that's a democratic principle. But if minorities are permanent minorities, then they need to be protected. And therefore, ethnic minorities, racial minorities, religious minorities are protected by all democratic constitutions. This will be qualified a little later, but let's understand. In a deeper democratic sense, minorities have to be protected after the, the Nazi experience, which was called democratic, mind you. Concentration camps were legal. They were legally mandated by a, a majority in government. Hmm? OK, India's democratic record, once again, this is sort of now, this is peer-reviewed consensus on how to measure these things. India's, India's Electoral record is, is the blue line. India's liberal record, as a, India's democracy, is the, something happened. Yeah, got it back. This is the liberal democracy line. India has always done better as an electoral democracy and never as well as, democrat, as, as liberal democracy. This particular gap, now it's very clear, after 2014, 2015, has become bigger and bigger. The gap between the liberal dimensions of democracy and electoral, that has become bigger, and you'll see, I'll document that case. And uh, VDEM data set, which has become our, our statistical bible on these issues, VDEM data set is saying that the gap between these two in India and United States and Brazil, three large democracies, has widened alarmingly in the last few years. So India is freest at the time of elections. Short of inciting violence, virtually any argument can be made in election campaigns. But once an elected government takes over, restrictions on basic liberal liberties, liberties are often placed. Intellectuals, writers, artists, students, non-governmental organizations, and in some cases, businessmen, can, be, can face harassment on grounds that they hurt the sentiments of certain groups or undermine national interest. In a multi-religious society, which has also had a deeply hierarchical system for centuries, some group or the other can always claim to be hurt. When group injury is claimed, governments in India rarely support the writer, the intellectual, the artist, the NGO. They support the group and shut the writer down, shut the NGO down, place enormous restrictions on freedom. These problems, common to all kinds of governments, Salman Rushdie's satanic verses were banned under Congress party because of the Muslim right protesting. Um, M.F. Hussain, India's leading painter, had to migrate, had to leave India because Hindu right claimed that his paintings of Hindu goddesses are profane. And Muslim right had claimed about satanic verses that it, it insults the prophet and therefore insults Muslim community. They were banned. One was banned, one had to leave the country. Government didn't protect. Hmm? The writer or the painter. But these problems become especially serious when Hindu nationalists come to power as is today. Why? Minorities automatically get added to the list of targets, not simply writers and, or artists. A Hindu-centric view of the nation leads to that. India for Hindu nationalists is a Hindu nation, which is a fundamentally unconstitutional idea. The constitution says India is owned by all religious communities not by the majority Hindu community. All religious communities equally own India is the constitutional position. Not that Hindu majority will have, majority community with a special privileges. That is not the constitutional position. A, so that's one, because they believe in, it's India, in India's Hindu majority owns the nation and minorities are secondary citizens, or should be. So, one, so minorities get automatically added to the list of targets. And a muscular nationalism threatening to exclude dissenters also comes into being, which leads to attack on liberal critics and dissenters, dissenters, which would include me. I write for newspapers also. And I'm identified as a liberal. That's true, I am. And therefore, I also become a target of attack, which, is, which you can follow on me. Um, on Twitter and, 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 and on the newspaper, on comments on the newspaper articles. BJP 
governments, here was the, our, our understanding, our conventional understanding, and I will now show how that has changed. BJP governments have always worked under three imperatives in India. One, ideological, namely India is a Hindu nation, and non-Hindu minorities are secondary citizens. That's the ideological position. That has driven their politics. Second, electoral, they also have to win their political party, they have to win elections. In, to win elections, they have to build coalitions, so some pragmatism always creeps in. Or crept in earlier, right? Three, a const because they are governments that take an oath to the constitution, and the constitution says India is owned equally by all religious and co communities, and constitutionally Hindu majority has no special legal or political privilege, that also they have to function in that framework. Constitution doesn't say yet, it's a Hindu nation. So, three and two, the electoral and the constitutional previously used to constrain the ideological. Therefore, my prediction after 2014 election was Modi would most probably be pushed towards the center. And I wrote, there's an article I'm citing here, but I wrote that within, within three months of the, of the of 2014 election. I viewed a right-wing shift as a low probability outcome. Instead, the low probability outcome, a rightward shift has come about. Alignment of the electoral and the ideological has taken place. BJP, what does it mean here? It means the following. They, what, they, they, uh, ideological, they, they see India as a Hindu nation, and electoral issues are Hindus consolidating around that idea. Please note, uh, we, will, we can go through various details of it. This one, of the 37.4% vote the BJP got, only 1.4% is non-Hindu. 36% is Hindu vote. Was it deemed, was it viewed as a possibility by political scientists, social scientists? No. Because Hindu society is caste cleaved. Right? And it was not easy to see the various castes trying to come together. BJP received 44% of Hindu vote, which amounts to 36% of their vote, national vote. 44% was not, it can go further than that. No one ever thought it was possible for, on the basis of Hindu vote alone, to go above 30%. It was not, it has gone to 37.4 now. 36%, and if this proceeds further, there, it would mean the following. There will be Hindu consolidation and Muslim irrelevance. That is the logic of this position. BJP, India is 14% Muslim. BJP does not have a single Muslim MP, member of parliament. Only 8% Muslims voted for BJP. Here is the detail of this. If the, my... my Pointer is not working for some reason. Okay. So you can see BJP vote in 2014, 54% of the upper caste voted. That has gone up to 61%. OBCs are the so-called middle caste. 34% had voted in 2014. That has gone up by 10 percentage points. Dalits and the Adivasis are at the lowest tier. Dalits, one-fourth of Dalits had voted for BJP in 2014. That has gone to one-third, gone up by nine percentage points. And Adivasis have gone up from 38 to 44 percent. Muslims remain stagnant at 8 percent. Right? For every Hindu category, upper OBC, Dalit, Adivasi, BJP's vote has significantly gone up. Right? Which is the point, if this goes up further, it goes up further, let's say, let's say it becomes 50% or 55% in the community, then Muslims would be entirely irrelevant to electoral outcomes in India. Entirely irrelevant. 14% hmm? of India will feel completely excluded from the electoral process. They have virtually, whichever way they, they can, only, only a, a, a pragmatic or voting option for them at that point would be voting for BJP, which says you are not uh, equal to Hindus. It is unlikely to happen. It's unlikely to happen. So, um, 
So Hindu consolidation has taken place. What are its implications for law and politics? This is the last set of remarks. Three merit consideration. Since the election of, of um, 2019, it's how many days? 100 days, 100 plus days. Three developments merit serious consideration. First, a new law has been passed in the lower and upper house and late. They have the, they have the votes now to, to, in, in parliament to do this. Unless the courts where it's been challenged rule the change unconstitutional, the new law, which is an amendment of an earlier law, will give the government power to designate any individual as a terrorist and to keep them in that state for months before judicial appeal against terrorist label is permitted. That is to say, it is essentially preventive detention without legal adjudication for months and months. It can be used against liberals and leftists, not simply against Muslims. The idea that you declare, you, you, the government calls you a terrorist, um, it can be on the basis of the books you carry in your flight or in your train. It can be on the basis of books that you're reading. And, and the government can then say you're a terrorist. The appeal can only be to the government first. And after that has failed, that, and there's a procedure for that, it can take up to two years or three years. You're in jail, you've appealed. You can get to the judiciary only after two years or three years, possibly five years but certainly not until the government has first looked at your appeal. Government will look at the appeal you made against the government decision to call you a terrorist. On whatever basis it calls you, right? So this, is, this has to be called, a, uh, so the title here is beleaguered uh, liberal freedoms, right? This is a fundamentally against the liberal argument that if you are arrested, you should be produced before a court of law. And the government should say why you've been arrested, and court should approve that. That's part of liberal freedoms. Hmm? Your freedom to read what you want to read, your freedom to speak what you want to say. Hmm? Now the beleaguered Muslim minority. Riots in India, which, they, which were the subject of my Hindu-Muslim book, have disappeared. But they have been replaced by lynchings. The ostensible aim of lynchings is to prevent three things. The eating of beef and production and selling of cow meat, premised on the claim that cows are sacred to Hinduism. Who eats beef? Some lower castes do in southern India and eastern India, but north and west Hindus don't eat beef. It's true. North and west. Not south and east. Hmm? And Muslims everywhere, all over India, eat beef. That is true, and they are also in cattle trade. Hmm. Second, Hindu conversion to, it, it, lynchings are also aimed, to, the aim is to prevent Hindu conversion to Islam. That is premised on the claim that such con conversion is always promoted by coercion, deceit, or material temptation. It's never free and honest. Three, attempts of young Muslim men to marry Hindu women or their romantic entanglements. That has to be prevented. This, I'll explain some, one detail of this in a moment. This is premised on the claim that these are aimed at increasing the size of Muslim population, which if not stopped now, would eventually overwhelm the Hindu population. So the issue here is not um, Muslim women and Hindu men either marrying each other or involved in a romantic relationship. The issue is Hindu women should not be the object of Muslim desire. Because that's a different, that is what is going to lead to, once she will become part of a Muslim family and that's how Muslim population will increase. But a Muslim woman can be the object of Hindu desire because she will become part of Hindu family and that's okay. So this whole love, the, the love jihad movement that has emerged is about Hindu women not getting involved with Muslim men, not the other way around. Hard to escape the impression that the fundamental aim of lynchings is establishment of Hindu primacy and reduction of Muslims to the sta status of secondary citizens. That is why vigilante groups not only catch suspected Muslims and perpetrate group violence on them, but they also force them to chant religious Hindu slogans such as Jai Shri Ram, Glory to Lord Ram. 
if the issue was simply swift punishment of theft or crime and not relying on the courts for that, the police for that because they take long, if that was the issue, there would be no need for a forced and violent imposition of Hindu religious slogans. Not, I mean, this is not to say you should lynch people um, um, at all. This is not saying. But if the, if the lynching is taking place and the lynching is followed by these slogans that, that the, those who are being lynched have to say, then this is clearly Hindu primacy that we're talking about. Any such, and such activity has not yet received clear, timely, forthright, unambiguous denunciation from the BJP governments, both at the center or the states. I've been studying um, uh, the African American lynching in the American South uh, from 18, there are very good data from 1880 to 1930. There also the issues are roughly the same. Establishment of a majoritarian political order and checking minorities from crossing a line, however that line is defined especially sexual line. Um, now, the final point. So, one was the law about terrorism, new law. Second was the, the um, lynchings, which have not been. Only one state, which is a Congress state, has come up with an anti-lynching law. The Supreme Court has asked the government to come up with an anti-lynching law in Parliament. Central Parliament has not happened. Not happened yet. Let's see whether it can happen. The third is Kashmir, that everyone is talking about. And I will argue that Kashmir reflects this contestation between liberal and electoral um, very, very clearly and almost paradigmatically for us. From an electoral perspective, what happened was democratic. Here is the argument, electoral argument. BJP received 220 million votes. Jammu and Kashmir had at best 8, mil 8, 8 million votes. And Kashmir Valley had at best 4.5 million votes. BJP has always been committed to the abrogation of Article 370, which gave Kashmir a special status in the Federation. Including, there's an, another article which says that only Kashmiris can buy land and non-Kashmiris cannot, there's Article 35. So it's been, it's been committed to the abrogation of 370, which gives Kashmir special rights, and Article 35, which, uh, which does not allow any non-Kashmiri to buy land or property in Kashmir. Right? It's been committed to the abrogation. Having won an enhanced majority, it used electoral powers to achieve its ideological aim. What happened, therefore, is consistent with this electoral meaning of democracy. Elections democratically enabled the BJP to effectively end Article 370 and 35, which it did, with parliamentary majorities. Right? That's the electoral side. Now, let's come to the liberal side. As I have said, all post-1945 democracies are not only based on the idea of power stemming from electoral majorities, but also on minority protections. I've already made that argument. After the Nazi experience, democracies tend to be liberal democracies. Hmm? The fact that the valley has only 4.5 million votes, Kashmir Valley, which is 96% Muslim, does not mean that 210 million votes can be imposed on it if the minority is racial, ethnic, or religious, not simply numerical, which is the case here. Had it been all mixed up, yes, majority wishes can be imposed. That's democracy. But this is actually a religious minority. It's not just a numerical minority. Hmm? Without minority protections, we have, I have argued already, democracy becomes a brute majoritarian fifth. Force. Following such brutishness, Kashmiri Muslim radicals had for all practical purposes thrown out Kashmiri Pandits, Kashmiri Hindus, a religious minority in Kashmir. Hindus might be a majority community in India, but they were a minority in Kashmir Valley. Hmm? They were expelled, basically, in 1991. If we critique that as undemocratic, the expulsion of Hindus as undemocratic and illegitimate, we must also critique what has happened since August 5 as undemocratic and illegitimate. Now, government of India is doing to Kashmiri Muslims what Kashmiri Muslims had done to Kash Kashmiri Hindus. Neither is, is legitimate. Neither is legitimate. Neither can be called democratic. Hmm? Um, finally, in a liberal democracy, those affected by a decision are given a chance to speak even if they are destined to lose. Losers are not beaten into silence in a democracy. That is done in authoritarian system. Losers, they know they're losing, but they have a chance to speak and make their case, 
even if they're losing. The valley, Kashmir Valley, is most vitally affected by this decision, but has been under lockdown for over nine weeks now, and its leaders are still in detention. Jail should not be the term. Well, it's jail, it's house arrest. It's, it's detention. Hmm? It's, all its leaders are detained. This is analogous to what happened on the eve of the emergency of June 25, 1975, when India for 18 months had a national emergency. Major opposition leaders were arrested before a president-approved order was presented to parliament and used to suspend democracy. Here, the government of India went to the president who approved government's executive decision to suspend democracy in Kashmir to arrest leaders. It presented that to parliament after the president approved. Parliament, they have a majority of their own. The parliament approved it. Right? This is what Mrs. Gandhi did in 1975 when the, she, she, she imposed national emergency. This is a Kashmir level emergency, not national emergency. emergency. Freedom of speech Freedom of speech and association have been taken away from the valley. Those who have lost, those who are most vitally affected are in jail or lockdown. And it's nine, it's what, nine weeks now, two, almost two months. Nine weeks? Yeah, almost two months. More, August 5, October 5 it will be, yes. So not nine weeks, eight weeks. Hmm? Okay. So this is the documentation of what has happened about the liberal side once again, remember, electorally, it was a remarkable achievement, what happened in India. At 67%, 0.4% turnout, the highest ever, Mr. Modi won with an enhanced majority. For the first time, that happened in 40 years. In, in, since 71, so more than 40 years. It's in, in half a century almost, a party returning to power with enhanced majority, one single party. So it was electorally a massive achievement, but liberally, on liberal dimensions, see what has happened as a result of that. So here is my conclusion then. If Hindu majoritarianism pushing itself electorally goes unchecked, if liberal freedoms are more curtailed than before, and if minorities become more beleaguered in the coming years, the longest lasting democracy of the global south will be fundamentally transformed from a substantially liberal democracy, that liberal, it was, it, it was always more successful electorally than liberally. It doesn't mean it was not a liberal, substantially liberal. That gap doesn't mean it was not substantially liberal. All liberal freedoms were enshrined in the Constitution. From a substantially liberal democracy to an illiberal majoritarian democracy, in conceptual terms, it will become a democracy like Malaysia today, like Israel today, like Sri Lanka today, and the United States before 1965, when the Civil Rights Act and the election and the electoral, electoral Act finally gave all blacks nationally, all over America, the right to vote and the right to right to access to all public spots without segregation, whether schools or roads or, or, or businesses, um, etc. Before 1965, even Dahl says America was not a deep democracy. The term is America was very racially based democracy until 65, and that was taken away after, with, this, with, the, with the revolution, political revolution of, the, of 1965, and it's argued that Mr. Trump is trying to go back to the pre-65 era, is the claim. So India, if this goes further, if Hindu consolidation goes beyond 44% to 50%, 55%, Mr. Modi will be re-elected in five years, and perhaps later. We can talk about what the checks might be. I have, I have a slide on that, but I think I've, let's just stop here for the, before Q&A begins. We are at a, at, a, at a point where you can see this grave conflict between the electoral and the liberal. Um, and this conflict is not, at this point, uh, being settled in favor of the liberal dimensions of democracy, but more in, in, uh, in, in terms of the electoral dimensions of democracy. So India will remain a democracy, but will be a very different kind of democracy, where minorities will be truly beleaguered, and liberal, and f those who want to write, want to have freedom to write, freedom to speak, freedom to, they also will be a beleaguered community. Thank you. We have time now for... Uh...
Uh, a few questions. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm sorry I, I came a bit late. I actually teach until 6.30. My name is Valentin Moradam. I'm professor of sociology and international affairs. What I heard was just outstanding, if a little disturbing. My question really has to do with the um, Dalits and other lower caste uh, voting patterns. And I'm wondering if they have always voted for the right or if they are following the pattern of many Europeans who have abandoned, say, socialist or social democratic parties because they felt those parties abandoned them and they have shifted their vote to right-wing populist parties. Is that a similar pattern with the Dalits? Something similar or? is happening. Ah, thank you. Something similar is happening. Um, here is the, so for example, even in 2014, one fourth, every fourth Dalit voted for BJP. That's a very serious development already. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this past year, this past uh, in May, by May, in April and May, every third Dalit voted for them, right? Um, Historically, Dalits have not voted for, for Hindu nationalists. Have not voted for Hindu nationalists. Historically, that's not. It's a change after 2014. There are complex reasons for it, but the pattern is roughly similar. The pattern that you identified for Europe is, is roughly the same. Yes. So now, now the vote for Congress is here. Dalits have voted, 33% of Dalits voted for BJP and only 20% for Congress party. It used to be the other way around, and much more so, actually, much more in favor of the Congress Party. Adivasi, similar. Adivasis are tribals. Look at that, 44% now, and only 31% uh, for Congress. It used to be the other way around, and much more so. Right. So yes, the pattern is roughly the same. Hi. Hi. My name is Netra Pan. Um, I'm a postdoc and visiting scholar at the business school. Yeah. Um, I studied political science and international affairs. Now I'm looking at social enterprise and how yeah. private actors can actually build together a social identity and a, a community identity. Yeah. So my question's a little bit linked to that. So first of all, thank you so much. And it's so interesting that Gandhi was so radical to say that there was something core to being Indian that could surpass, that could include even English people. My question is to you, what... Quite a radical formulation. This is 1906. Yeah. In I, 1906, I mean, he's making this claim. 1907, he's making this and claim. And I think it's, it's wonderful because right? it, mm. it's basically saying that this is the birth of India and not, you know, the drawing of the map right. um, by the British. Um, and so my question to you is, what would you um, say is core to being Indian or what, it, what would be required for an Indianization? And does India have the cultural resources to do this? And the reason why I ask that is because you can see with the United States, the certain political parties now and in Canada, how they talk about this idea of a melting pot and there's a lot of symbolism of, of being a, you know, a country of immigrants. And so I'm wondering, you know, this gives me hope, for example, in this very polarizing identity driven community that we see in the United States now. And I'm wondering what you see yeah. as so, the solution in uh, India. So excellent question. It has been debated a lot in both in democratic uh, literature on democracy and literature on nationalism and ethnic conflict. So there are basically two models. One is the melting pot model. The other is, a, is a, now it's because we use the term melting pot, so the alternative formulation is salad bowl, right? And the claim, um, the theoretically, the metaphors mean the following. A melting pot means you melt into a pot, and the pot is majoritarian, right? Um, and or not majoritarian, but defined in a certain way, however the Constitution defines it or however politics uh, uh, ha have defined it, right? Salad bowl argument basically is that you don't have to melt into a pot and lose your identity. If salad is, has cucumber, has, has onions, has tomatoes, uh, and, and they don't lose their identity, but it's still a, it's a lovely salad. You can enjoy it. So you can make a nation through a salad bowl or you can make a nation through a melting pot. Canada is a leading example of a salad bowl nation. India also wanted a salad bowl nation. The Hindu nationalists say it should be a melting pot nation. And the pot into which you have to melt is the Hindu pot here. Right? Now, incidentally, the term a melting pot has been used a lot in America, but in nationalism theory, America is seen as a cultural salad bowl and a political melting pot because it allows the hyphen. 
Americans, Irish Americans, uh, are, are, are uh, Hispanic Americans, are, are wasps, are etc., are Greek Americans, are Jewish Americans. So the left side of the identity is seen as cultural. You can have your own newspapers, you can have your own music, you can have your own places of worship, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and your own, you can keep your own language for your children, your grandchildren, etc. And the political, the melting pot side is the right hand, right? So Irish American Americanness there, that's a political definition, right? So, so um, American culture has been changing by this logic, by this theory. American culture has changed a lot, but the idea that America is about freedom and equality enshrined in the Declaration of Independence has not changed. And Americans, while they might have, for example, the pre-65 era, the blacks didn't believe it was about freedom and equality. They were neither free nor equal. But that's where America was headed again and again. So after 1965, it also included the most excluded community historically. Right? So, so, it, so the, the salad bowl idea basically is that you can have your own languages, you can have your own religions, but you can still be Indian if you believe in some core values. And those values, there's contestation over what those values are. But ultimately, after 1947, it's the constitu values enshrined in the Constitution of India. Right? That is the India that constitu Constitution defined as India, is what, and, and it, has talk, it has talks about tolerance, plurality, pluralism, and syncretism. As, as a definition of Indian culture. Tolerance, pluralism, and syncretism. Yeah, but, di but diversity, and it also calls itself, it says India will build unity in diversity. Right? So it's a salad bowl idea, right? So you don't, the tomatoes can remain tomatoes, but you know, but they become part of a bowl. Right? Onions, tomatoes, and, and uh, you know, they become part of a bowl, and that bowl is India, is the claim. Right, so you can possibly say the salad dressing is 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 what the what the is tolerance and pluralism and syncretism. That's salad dressing for the salad. Thank you for your interesting. Incident, talk. Sorry, I didn't say America is cultural salad bowl in that and um, a political melting point. The biggest melting point of the world is France, in that literature. It doesn't allow the hyphen. There's nothing called Jewish French. There's nothing called North African French as a category. It's just French. Yeah. So thank you for interesting talk. I'm an exchange student from Japan, and my question is, like, what if, like, when uh, India stops to protect the m minority, which is now seems happening, uh, in addition to marginalizing minorities and social c division, what are expected to happen in India in terms of economies? like politics or like dip diplomacy, what uh, expects to happen in India? See, this was not about, this is not a political economy lecture. I have worked on that. For example, I didn't discuss um, the relation between politics and economics. The only political economy issue here was income and democracy. Other than that, there is no economic uh, term that I used. So uh, marginalization of minorities is currently underway, but that is not how India was built. India was built about, a, they, just look at the, what India's first prime minister said, who shaped Indian polity about minorities. Here we go. Why the Muslim minority India must have full citizenship rights. This is Jawaharlal Nehru. India's prime minister from 1947 to, to 64, and a major force in the making of the constitution. Major, major force in the making of the constitution and setting up original foundational ideas for the polity. Whatever the provocation from Pakistan and whatever the indignities and horrors inflicted on non-Muslim minorities there, we have to deal with our minority in a civilized manner. We must give them security and the rights of citizens in a democratic state. If we fail to do so, we shall have a festering sore which will eventually poison the whole body politic and probably destroy it. Muslims are going to be equal citizens of India. Minorities. This is how India was, Indian, independent India was built. Right? And it, marginalization has certainly been underway. But that's not the story from the beginning. Okay. On the impact of democracy on economics, uh, I... Is that people? If people are interested in that, um, 
I think I think it, economic economic outcomes are more determined by economic policy than democracy. Democracy indirectly does something. But the direct impact is from economic policy. So India's growth rate has declined to 5% to from what it was at 7, 7.5, 6.8. <laughs> if India's growth rate has declined, which has been the source of object of a lot of commentary, the, the direct reason for that is not democracy and marginalization of Muslims or minorities. The direct reason is the economic policy. And why, and, and most important issue there is, India's investment over GDP, that ratio, investment over GDP was all, for the last 10, 15 years, for, until 2015 or so, from roughly 2000, it, 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 the average, if you do an average of that, moving average, it was about 35%. India was in, investing 34 to 35% of its income, of its GDP, right? And that has dropped below 30%. How to get it back to 35% is one of the main objects of economic policy today and will determine the growth rate. Democracy has an indirect relationship with growth, and I, we can talk about that. But the may, if, if your concern was economic growth, then it's the main issue right now is not democracy, though, yes, there's an indirect connection, which we can discuss if you want. The main issue there is economic policy. What kind of economic policy will attract investors again? both domestic and foreign. What will take India back to 35% investment over GDP ratio is, is the main issue. Yeah. Hi, uh, James Hackney, Dean of the Law School. So with respect to the issue of causation, democracy, and economic development, one theory in the United States is that the rise of Trump is because of economic policies that have led to the kind of decline of the middle class. Right. So there's causation between economic decline and illiberalism. Yeah. What would you say is the causation link between illiberalism or the what has led to illiberalism in India? Right. Your so uh, globalization was not an unmixed blessing for the West because lots of jobs went away to China, India, Asia in general, right? So industrial towns of Wisconsin and Ohio and Wisconsin has been studied extensively by political scientists. Uh, they've been devastated. Um, now, India and China are two of the biggest beneficiaries of globalization. And their growth rates went up significantly. The India... In, while India is still at $2,000 per capita and China has reached about nine, nine or nine and a half, maybe 10 by now, um, uh, they and, and the growth rates were not only were the growth rates very high as a result of their, how they use globalization, insertion into, the, into global markets, but uh, they also lifted millions of people out of poverty. Right? So it has been a big blessing for India and China unlike the West, globalization. They've been, these are two of the biggest beneficiaries of globalization. So that link that exists in, for America and, and that link that explains the rise of, or partly explains the rise, only partly in my view explains the rise of Trump. There's a lot of white nationalism going on there. We have studied this as political scientists. Hmm? It's not simply economic dislocation and economic disadvantage felt by a lot of communities, but also the idea that, that um, Democratic Party under Obama went too far towards minorities, right? Um, now, the second idea, the idea that Congress Party, like the Democratic Party, went too far to embrace minorities is certainly an issue in India. That part of, uh, that part of American politics or West European politics, European politics in general, that part does apply to India, hmm? but in that sense not in the sense of economic dislocation or economic devastation of white, white working class or economic devastation of, a, you know, or the idea that the, the, the rural, rural Britain was feeling very threatened by the arrival of the Poles and the, and the Hungarians and, the, and a lot of East Europeans coming into, to, into Britain because of, the, because of the economic community and free migration, right? 
that's not the problem. The problem is in economic, economics was not the issue in the rise of Modi. In the rise of Modi, the issue certainly was some kind of Hindu insecurity and, and a belief in, a, in, in, in increasingly in, in increasingly larger numbers of people that India went too far in towards embracing minorities and neglected Hindus, the majority community. <clears throat> Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I'm a doctoral candidate in international relations at Oxford, and it so coincided uh, with your visits uh, that I'm here in Boston. So I've been reading your work since 91, especially your work on Kashmir. So oh, it's you. really, uh, really great to be here. Um, I have a question about a sort of, and I, since I do international relations, I'm coming from that uh, perspective. How much do you attribute the Indian case, so the turn to right-wing populism in India, the larger sort of patterns in, the, in liberal Western democracies? And do you think of the Indian case as a part of that wave or different? Um, and just quickly, um, how close do you think we are uh, in India to a, re a revision or an amendment of the constitution for us to become a Hindu Rashtra? Do you think uh, we're close? Uh, do we need to panic? Because from your analysis, it seems we are going back on all those indicators that you had on your second slide on Indian democ on democracy. Thank you. Excellent question. Okay, so two parts of the question. One is uh, whether the emerging world trend towards right-wing populism, Trump, um, Brexit, um, National Front in France becoming a, getting to 42% of vote, etc. Not winning, but I mean just alarming, 42% of vote. Um, Poland, Hungary, uh, Mr. Viktor Orban of Hungary, um, Philippines, all of that. Yeah? But I think I, I don't think we can say India was Indian voter was influenced by that. I don't think we can make that connection. I don't think we can make that argument. But independently, India is headed in that direction. That's an in, that reasons have some have nothing to do with international influence. The reasons have a lot to do with what's happening inside India, right? So that's my that would be my claim to your that would be my response to your first question. Your second question is India headed towards. Um, a fundamental revision of the constitution and uh, from 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 the core claim of the constitution that all religion religious communities of india equally own india and hindu majority has no special legal or cultural rights right from there is india headed towards hindus own this nation and minorities Minorities exist in India at the sufferance of the Hindus, right? That that uh, that is what you're you, now. I'm not sure whether that can happen constitutionally because constitutional amendment is very hard in India, and certainly um, uh, the existing judicial um, uh, interventions and the position, therefore, of the judiciary thus far has been that constitutional amendment can change any article of the constitution, but not the basic structure. Basic structure is, cannot be changed, right? So if the judicial trick is going to be the following, if you think that um, religious neutrality or all religions owning the Indian nation equally is part of the basic structure, then it cannot be changed. But if either parliament claims under BJP and, B, and, the and the court agrees it's not part of the basic structure, then in principle, constitution, that part of the constitution can be amended. And we can head towards, legally, head towards a Hindu Rashtra. Right? That itself will require constitutional amendment in India, no, no constitution easily amended. Legal reform is very different from constitutional reform because it requires super majorities and it requires also, it's something like that, require half of India states approving that, right? So super majority in the two houses of parliament, two thirds and above, right? Two thirds, not three fourths in India, two thirds and half of a state assembly is approving that. Now is, is BJP has to reach that position, it may in the next five years, quite possible. 
in which case it can put that amendment through, right? And if the cons if the, it will be challenged in the court, if the court says religious neutrality of the state is not the part of the basic structure, then Hindu Rashtra has a right, right? Will have a right. If the court says part of the basic structure, then we have a serious executive versus judicial struggle coming up. So much depends, therefore, on what position the, the co Supreme Court of India takes on what is the basic structure of the Constitution. And if A and B, whether religious neutrality of the state is part of the basic structure. The court becomes a very important uh, determinant of that. Its position, it is not going to be easy for executive or parliament to ride roughshod over the judiciary. Judiciary, either it caves or it independently comes with the judgment. The judiciary, its bench, constitutional bench, comes with the judgment, comes up with the judgment. No, Hinduism is the, the, the core of Indian nationhood. Then the battle is over. Ashutosh, yeah. can, you, can you just, in that context, clarify, uh, give us your thoughts on the court? How independent is it? The most powerful institutional challenge to executive power typically comes from the judiciary, at least in parliamentary systems. In presidential systems, Congress can play that role, right? Because, but in parliamentary systems, the, the uh, the legislature and the executive are, inter are tightly connected. Those who win the major a majority in the legislature also run the government. There is no separate election for the executive head as in presidential systems. Very popular in South America and of course in the United States of America right since, uh, right since the formation of the constitution. So in a parliamentary system like the British system or India which is a, has a parliamentary system or Canada, the court becomes the most serious challenger to executive authority, right? There is no other balance, big balance, big check and balance available. Um, and the judiciary is also the final arb arbiter of constitutionality or legality in modern, modern, and I would say, I should correct that, modern parliamentary democracies. The rationale for the existence of the judiciary is not popular wishes which can be highly prejudicial and can articulate deep-rooted biases. Lynchings of African-Americans, after all, were popular in post-Civil War American South. Untouchability was popular in India. But the Constitution said abolish untouchability on the basis of certain larger principles, not popular prejudices, larger principles. Hmm? Um, so, if popular wishes are against constitutional legal principles and the executives or, or the legislatures, ex they, they express such wishes, then the judiciary whose functioning is determined in principle by the ideals of the constitution is often the biggest institutional adversary of the idea of popular sovereignty. It is therefore called counter-majoritarian judicial intervention. Judicial intervention is not about popular wishes if popular wishes are full of prejudices. Right? So, hence, populists universally dis are distrustful of courts and either seek to change the constitution after coming to power or use executive power to create a planned judiciary, right? What about the application of these principles to India? Executive judiciary tensions are out in the open. Justice Chalameshwar's letter to the Chief Justice, which was leaked with uh, Supreme Court uh, in 2018, March 2018, basically says, India's executives is interfering too much in the functioning of the judiciary. That's, the, 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 that's what the letter says. Typically, these things are, you know, are trapped in confidential interaction. But justice, the just, justice, he actually leaked his own letter because he was felt so threatened by it, what the executive or Modi government was doing. And that letter basically says, if judicial independence goes away, if we don't protect it in, in the Supreme Court of India, we don't protect judicial independence, India's democracy will collapse. That's what it says. And there is a real threat of that. The letter says that by a senior judge. And he leaked that letter. This was a letter he wrote to the Chief Justice. So there are real doubts about whether courts will behave independently. Now, India, unlike America, which has nine judges, India has 31 judges. 
and and it is very hard for executive to to push all 31 of them or buy all 31 of them it's very hard but it's not all 31 who pronounce judgments it's a bench that pronounces judgment bench is constituted by the chief justice whether five judges should be on a bench seven judges should be on a bench 11 judges should be on a bench if a question like hindu rashtra is is hindu is hinduism the core of indian nationhood right if that is submitted to a bench which has 11 which is the largest it's going to be very hard for 11 judges to be just bought over or to be coerced. It's going to be very hard. If it's going to be three judges as opposed to 11, then it's easier. That's simply pragmatic politics between executive and judiciary. But the principle of judicial independence is under grave threat and now the judges have leaked their letters expressing that anxiety. They have received, obviously, whatever communication that has come from executive uh, about, about certain decisions that they had to take. Okay, I think we have a final question here. Um, thank you for coming to speak to us tonight. Um, my question is, uh, can you speak to the role of um, traditional forms of media such as newspapers and uh, TV media in India, but also modern forms of communication like WhatsApp in encouraging Hindu consolidation and asymmetric polarization in India? So, um, like right-wing populists, even left-wing populists, like populists everywhere, Mr. Modi doesn't like the traditional press. He has not given a single press conference. It's six years, six, five and a half years in power. He's not given a single press conference after becoming prime, not even one. He communicates to the masses not through traditional media, but through his radio program called Man Ki Baat, meaning straight from the heart. This is a radio program that reaches out to millions of people. Hmm? And his party uses WhatsApp uh, for its communication more than anything else. WhatsApp reaches, and the estimate is WhatsApp reaches something like 400 million Indians today. The numbers keep, they are so rapidly rising that, you know, 400 is when I last saw it, right? So the party uses WhatsApp for its communication, not the traditional media. And Prime Minister uses his radio broad, monthly radio broadcast going out to millions and millions of people. Uh, and traditional media, uh, whether television or newspapers, both have expressed the view in many, in all, in, 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 not, in, in, very, ex, in very explicit manner that they feel threatened by the executive that there are very few independent houses of traditional media left. One is the paper for which I write, Indian Express. If it, if it sold its soul, I wouldn't write for it, and I would, I, would, I would withdraw my columns from there. Second is NDTV on television. And you can think of a few more, that's it. Tel Telegraph in Calcutta is a remarkably independent newspaper. And the Hindu in, from Chennai, now all over India, is fairly independent, but expresses itself not in a very... It's unduly polite, the Hindu, right? Whereas Express and Telegraph and NDTV, they take positions which are more forthright and, and stronger, um, and don't wrap themselves in undue politeness, uh, which Hindu does. Hindu is independent, I'm not saying that, but it's very politely so politely independent. Sometimes in politics you have to sort of, you know, raise your voices in a much more uh, forthright way. Yes, sir. Okay, so, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, okay, so just to sum it all up, uh, okay, I acknowledge that probably over a billion Indians have committed a mass stupidity huh? by... Uh, a massive stupidity. Right. By re-electing Modi. And I mean, I'm not trying to say that, okay, if Modi is good or Modi is bad, that's a completely different topic. But 
what according to you is the solution? Because uh, in 2019 elections, if I remember correctly, there were not many parties who were contesting or like, you would of course not want Rahul Gandhi as your prime minister, right? That would be, again, a massive stupidity. So what according to you is the solution? Like, of course, Modi is trying to connect to a lot of people. He is priming and he is able to connect at a very personal level with a lot of people. There's a huge media backing. He has a political image, which is now more popular than any other Indian prime minister has had. But what is the solution to all this, it's a, according it's a, to you? It's a, a very important question. It's also a very difficult question to, to analyze. And let me tell you why, as a political scientist, I, I cannot fully answer you. I think this, is, this question is, the real, is in the realm of psychology. Standard political science fails when you deal with Trumps and Modis. It just fails. We have, don't have the equipment to analyze why, why Mr., uh, Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump's latest number in, Republican, in the Republican base are 92%, which is about 35-36% of the United States of America. Right? Despite all that has happened, 92%. It's gone up from 86 to 92, according to the most recent poll. I think the one today or yesterday, something is happening. It's coming down because, maybe coming down because of Ukraine. We don't know yet, right? I also cannot explain to you that what is it that the masses see in these figures. Mr. Modi is a professional politician. Mr. Modi is no outsider entering. Mr. Modi didn't come into it through beauty contests and, and you know, you know, He's not irresistibly drawn to that which is glamorous and gorgeous. Mr. Modi is a professional politician. Mr. Modi is also the, has, a, has had a life which, is, which has not been given to luxury. Right? Now, why is it that so many Indians vouch for him and his politics, is it for his politics, it's for his personality? I, I think the, the psychologists like Ashish Nandi Psychologists like Sudhir Kakkar and psychologists in America should analyze that. That really goes beyond the traditional training of political scientists. How do you get these figures becoming so? I mean, there, there is a. If uh, I was watching the Houston rally, I was not there in the stadium. There is a sense in which you know the fifty thousand screaming Indian Americans just trying to either touch his feet or embrace him or say yes, sir. Yes, sir, you are it, right? I, I, I don't have the equipment to analyze that. There's something psychological going on. There's some psychological needs that, that the, these leaders are fulfilling, are responding to in a way that previous leaders have not. Is that not part of the bigger propaganda which has been, which is now being staged like this, but has probably been doing for years and years altogether? Because even before 2015 elections, See. Modi was kind of getting popular and social media was full of posts which were like very, very prominent. Yeah, I mean, um, so he grew up in a very poor family. Uh, the, this, the story he told in San Francisco watch at the Facebook headquarters, watched by millions and millions of people with the, with the lump in his throat. I mean, that is, that is pretty serious political stuff. I grew up in a very poor family. I sold tea at the railway sta train stations with my father. My mother used to wash pots and pans of neighbors to put us through, put, put, um, put, 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 put uh, dal and roti on the, um, dal and bread on the, on the table for all, for all of us. And then he, le he goes, leaves his wife, uh, uh, he's 17, 18 at that time, and he goes to the Himalayas. And he, and he becomes, and he uh, achieve, an, uh, adopts the path of renunciation. Then he comes and joins BJP, the RSS, and, and works tirelessly, right? Then he, from there he goes to BJP, and then he becomes Chief Minister of Gujarat, right? And, and uh, the idea that he has no family, the, he left the wife, so I think, I mean, technically it's a divorce, legally it isn't, right? He doesn't have a family, he doesn't have children, so he doesn't use politics to, to promote his children, to promote his wife, to promote his nephews, to promote his nieces. He doesn't do any of that. Right? 
the it generates a certain image you know in a in a polity where every politician has promoted their children promoted their nephews etc the, the lot of democratic politics is about this this kind of stuff right N modi is absolutely different from this so so it generates a certain kind of image i and i don't i don't have the equipment to analyze it the idea that the after the election is over he goes to a cave wearing wearing the the dress of a renouncer right who's renounced the world who goes to a cave and millions of people are following that and saying wow i don't know how to analyze that i really don't know i i i've never never been trained to analyze things like that let's let's ask psychologists what what's this phenomenon right so that's my answer to you not a satisfactory one but i i'm i'm honestly stating my, the professional limits of a political scientist we can't analyze these figures on that note ash <laughs> you've given us a lot to think about a lot more questions than than answers thank you so much